for the final section of lecture then um, we're going to look at a, a case example and we're going to look at uh, some measurements of um, a beam in bending and do some analysis for it. Uh, so the beam I'm going to use is, is um, this is just a, a bit of spaghetti uh, uncooked um, that obviously we can put reasonable deflections into and, uh, and measure the shape changes. Um, the geometry I'm going to use is a, a three point bend geometry quite a simple one it's used a lot in in laboratory tests and um, and I can do that just at home here and, and make some measurements for you we'll run through the analysis first uh, and then we'll set up a, a bend rig and make some measurements so um, just to remind you then of our three-point bend uh, analysis so we have a geometry with two simple supports here uh, a span in between them that I'm going to call in total uh, 2L and we're going to just going to load it with a point load in the middle and of course if we if we do that we have a point load in the middle you can work out what the reactions are at the two support points simply if you resolve vertically uh, you know that the reaction here plus the reaction there has to equal the downwards force here and if you take moments at one end of the other uh, you can find that the uh, the load is split evenly between those two supports so we have p upon two at either at either end if we want to work through to to work out the bending moments then we take a virtual section so if we uh, cut somewhere in here in this uh, span here this first um, l first length here l make a cut in here uh, then we'll have a model like this where we've got a support at our uh, a reaction at the support here and at some distance x away uh, we'll have on the cut face um, a vertical shear force and then we've also got a bending moment and if we work our way through this we'll see that the shear force is constant over this initial span and then makes a jump to another value as we as we move the other side of that central force Whereas the bending moment builds up linearly as we step further and further away from uh, this uh, linear force here at the other end, um, the moment builds up to the center and then we'll drop back down again on the other side. And so the moment that we find um, in this half here simply goes like this, that the moment goes as load, multiply x, the distance from the support, Sorry, that arrow is slightly wrong. It should be measured from the support. Um, so load times distance from the support divided by two just gives us that the slope of that blue line. Um, as we switch to the other half of the beam, uh, then uh, it's a, a slightly different formula, but essentially it follows that with some symmetry. What we've just seen um, in the, the first bit of, of lecture eight is that we can relate that bending moment which we've just just worked through for this example here um, to the curvature in the beam the stiffness of the material and the second uh, moment of area for the cross section of our beam and the radius of curvature here rho is related to um, the second derivative of the displacements the vertical displacements of the beam in here and so now we can put together a, a formula that's that talks about the second derivative of displacement uh, and write it in terms of m. m we already know, the bending moment we already know, it goes as px over 2 um, and we've got our, our stiffness and uh, second moment of area in, in here. Well if we know that for the second derivative we can integrate that um, to find what the first derivative d, dv by dx well, this is essentially the slope um, of our beam uh, and if we do that well this bit's constant here the only bit that varies uh, with position x uh, is x uh, so we integrate that that will go to x squared um, we need to divide by 2 again so that 2 has jumped to a 4 here and of course we have to add on a constant of integration now to tidy up that constant of integration we can go to well different points along the beam here 
uh, and just think about what the boundary conditions are. What do we actually know um, about the beam? And actually what's going to happen as we push in here is that actually it's free to, to tilt and we'll get some gradient at this end, we'll get some gradient at that end. But the point we know um, what happens to the gradient of the displacements is actually in the centre here because this centre point will be some um, some minimum in the shape and if we've got some minimum in the shape then right at the bottom that, that gradient has got to be um, has got to be flat has got to be zero so we know dv by dx is zero at that centre point when x is equal to l okay and if that's the case we can just substitute in here so we've got zero on that side x is l in here and so um, this then gives us an expression for uh, that first uh, constant of integration. OK, um, so we know that C1 is just going to be minus this lot here. And if we put that in um, up to this top line here, so we jump up here, just subs in for C1 here as this term. And now for the slope, I've got one term in x squared. Uh, one term that's a constant and if I want the displacement itself v I integrate again so the x squared goes to an x cubed I'm going to divide by 3 so uh, 3 times that 4 gives me the 12 and then this term in here is just well is constant so that will go to a integrate to go go to a term in x plus some constant of integration at the end here and again, now we think about displacements in the beam. Well, where do we know the displacements? Actually, we have a choice. We could either say I'll measure all my displacements from the lowest point, um, or I can say I'll measure my displacements from the uh, from the height of the um, the support points here. And that's what I'm going to choose to do. I'm going to call uh, the height here at the supports. Um, uh, v will be zero here. So at x is zero, v is zero, which means as these two both vary with x, um, x goes to zero on these two so for v to be zero c2 must also be zero and so this will simplify um, to this expression here so this expression here for v then will give me the displacements or the, the bent shape um, of the deflected beam under some load p um, importantly and I, I should have stressed this at the start, of course, our expression here for moment that we're working on only works when we're in this this first span here, this left hand span, um, when X is somewhere between uh, zero and L. On the other side, we'd have to write things down again. But you you can see from the symmetry of the object, if we know what happens in this first span, we can mirror it across to know what happens in the second span. OK. And the only other thing I've done in here is just pick out the, the obvious thing of um, what we might make a measurement of is actually a deflection of a, um, a centre point in here, uh, the movement of that, that load um, point. And so if we just subs in for x is equal to l in the centre here, uh, then you can see that that will go to an l cubed term. That's another l cubed term you've got. Um, uh, 1 over 12 here and minus uh, 3 over 12 here uh, so minus 2 over 12 or 1 sixth of all this lot here so that's the displacement in that center point here okay um, well what does this this expression look like if we plotted it out again remembering this result is in that first uh, span in here and then we have symmetry around the center point then well what have we got uh, as um, the the x cube term uh, increases we know that it goes down to this this uh, minimum point in the in the middle here and at that middle minimum minimum point excuse me when um, x is equal to l then this term and this term cancel out so the gradient goes to zero in the center which makes sense if it's got to be symmetrical that's kind of what has to happen um, uh, in here and you can also see that actually as we uh, 
as we move further away from this center point uh, in here, the gradient is going to get um, steeper and steeper. And so it takes some, some bent shape like this. Uh, and so one way we could, uh, we could set things up, actually, there's a couple of different ways we, we could do this. If we, for a known load on the beam, uh, we measured these displacements as a function of position through here, we could fit the data to this shape in here. And um, if we know the load, we know the positional information, then we can work out what uh, Young's modulus is, as long as we know what the uh, second moment of area is. So as long as we know the dimensions um, of the beam cross section, then we could use the shape, deflected shape, uh, to work out Young's modulus. The other thing we could do is to work out what the displacement in the center is, at, as uh, x is l, and plot that as a function of uh, the applied load p. Uh, that will be linear, but again will depend on uh, Young's modulus and we could use that to uh, work out what Young's modulus is and it's that second thing that's normally done on a, an automated test in a um, in a mechanical testing lab um, but actually uh, what we're going to look at is the deflected shape just to one to, to verify that that formula is sensible uh, and two we could also extract our um, uh, our modulus from that. Okay so the next thing to do is to set up a um, a bend test rig that we can uh, we can use to test our, our piece of spaghetti. Okay, I think I've got things lined up now. So uh, you can see we've got the, uh, the, the scales here um, with the rig on top uh, and my piece of pasta in between. So one bending point, uh, support point here, one over here. And hopefully you can see if I, I press on there, we're gonna pick up any load that I put on. At the moment we're zeroed, so I've zeroed to the pasta and the lower bit of the rig and then you can see at the front here this is just another camera uh, that will be looking at the pasta um, to take its uh, an image of its shape and there was the view that we we have from here so as I start applying load in the middle here uh, in the middle here down here uh, we'll be able to see how the the shape of the uh, the pasta changes uh, and we'll measure the load from the um, from the other view. So I'm going to put the uh, that view into the from the top there um, into the corner. Uh, we'll put the top part of the rig on. There's some weight um, obviously associated with uh, with with that. So we'll record that. We're recording here in uh, in grams um, here, so you can see uh, the zero grams being recorded at the moment in there let's put the loading on the top top part of the loading rig goes in here you can see it come down and you can see probably already that there's a slight deflection on the on the pasta and we've got a um, we've got a load on here of, uh, of 24 grams right now we'll start putting some more load on the top and uh, we'll see how things things deflect so i'm just going to put some uh, coins on the top so what does that move to that's 34 grams now about 41 grams now at 50 grams 57 grams 66 grams and you can see a definite curvature to the to the beam in there 
uh, we're at 75 grams, 83 grams, ninety eight grams that's one hundred and twelve grams one hundred and twenty six grams and you can see well you can see the shape of the the beam deflecting in there um, I'm not going to be able to apply enough load on the top to uh, uh, to, to break it by putting these coins in. 146. Let's take it up to 150 if we can. That wasn't quite enough. So add another couple of small coins. 151. Okay, we've overshot. Okay, um, so you can see that deflection in there. If I take the coins back off, um, you'll see things retract. This is obviously a bit more fiddly to do. Um, that's down to 131 now. What are we in at now? 106. Seventy-seven. That one at 75. Trying not to move the whole rig. 57. I did move the rig then. Uh, that's down just 30 grams. Let's remove that. We're back to our uh, 23, 24. And if I take this away from this off, and you see that we've moved back. But of course, I've moved the rig a little bit as I've done that. As well as recording the video, I took some stills as we as we went along, and this is one of them. So this was recorded uh, with a load of 179 grams on the spaghetti, and you can see the spaghetti bent through here. And we're going to take this as an example and just measure up um, the curvature of the the beam in here. And I'm going to use some some MATLAB to do that. I'll make the script script available to you, and I'll, I'll make some of these stills available to you as well. Um, first thing I'm going to do though, uh, you'll just notice um, that there's a slight tilt in the in the frame here. My camera wasn't um, properly aligned with uh, with the vertical on my on, on my rig. Um, and so I'm just going to take uh, take that out just by uh, noting what a straight line is that goes from uh, one contact point there to the other side and another contact point over there and we just take that rotation out to start with. Okay so here's my MATLAB script and I'm just going to start um, running this section by section. So the first section here you see you just use um, a couple of percentage signs uh, one after the other to, to mark off sections and I can just run this top section. All that's done is just loaded the um, the image in and then selected a sub subsection that's uh, got the beam in it. I don't I don't need the rest of the scales and other things in there. Um, next section then uh, it's just going to display that image and then uh, I'm just going to mark on the left hand point here and the right hand point just where it intersects with the Lego and the um, and the pasta and I hit return that's all that section does next section just works out the gradient of that line and applies a rotation um, to my image takes that back out and then I'll display here the rotated image uh, with the two sides leveled up and now I'm going to click one side and I click a whole bunch of points across the beam to capture its shape. Um, now I'm not going to put 
too many points on here because it takes a little time to do it. Um, if I were doing it a bit more slowly and carefully, we'd probably get more accurate results. Um, and indeed, if I were trying to do this in in earnest, I'd probably write a, a little bit of script to try and um, use some image analysis just to find the edge of the the pasta and I guess that's one other thing I should have said it's it's easy to easier to to demark the edge of the pasta than the the center line of it so that's what I'm what I'm doing and um, the two edges follow the same shape just offset and I just need to work out where the, the intersect here is with a, a line on the, the the pasta here and then we'll hit return and it will just put those things into um, some, some variables. So the positions are in little xj, little yj in here. Um, I'm just going to subtract off the, the position of the left hand point, just make that the origin, and then we'll plot uh, what we just measured up. So that's what we've measured up. That was my left hand point through to the center and then back out the other side. Now, uh, if you remember the analysis that we uh, we ran through for the beam, of course, actually works properly on one side and then is sort of symmetric on the other side. Um, I'm going to bring these other points across here uh, so that they're all all combined on on one side of the on one one span, if you like. Um, and to do that, then um, I'm just going to uh, note um, note how many points I've got on my list. Look at the uh, the right hand uh, point, its position, and cut that in half, and that will give me the uh, the dimension L that I wanted. And then I'm just going to use this little bit of script here just to fold things back into that. Um, equivalent positions on the left hand side and, and replot things. So there we go. So that's just brought, uh, if I bring up my uh, other plot, oh no, I've plotted it over it, so it's in the same same thing in here. So I've just brought the data that was on the right over, over to, the, to the left here. So vertical displacements here, um, I've lost a sign in here because of the way the image axis runs in, in MATLAB. Um, and uh, this is position across the across the beam here. And you can see that my two left and right hand end, um, there's a little offset between them and that just that's just how well I've uh, lined the data set up, I guess. OK, so uh, the next thing uh, to do then would be to uh, fit that to uh, to our function and so uh, in here uh, is the function that we had for the displacements in our in our uh, beam um, that's in the, the the PowerPoint that we've just talked through um, and so the the X's in here are the position across the beam the a B C and D are parameters that I need to I need to fit uh, to establish what what they what they are numerically. Um, you'll see how I've set this up. There's a there's a term in x cubed with a, a constant in front of it. Um, I'm just allowing there to be a, an offset in the origin in the uh, the x position. I might not have correctly located that that first point um, for the beam, so that's why there's a an offset here. Hoping that's small, it means I haven't made too big an error. Here's our second term um, uh, that's uh, that's just in x, and it's related. The coefficient out the front is related here to the first term, but there's also a um, this c squared is actually an l squared in the formula, and then there's a constant here d. And again, I might have a, an offset on the uh, on the vertical axis here, and that takes that up, and all the text in here. This just defines some um, some upper and lower bounds for the the, the the parameters a, b, c, and d in here. 
uh, and some start points for a search for a fr fitting process that's just going to fit try and fit that functional form to the data that we just had. So here's the the output from the MATLAB that we were looking at the MATLAB equation that we were fitting to and this is the equation that we had in from the derivation of beam bending theory. Um, you can see the slight differences in here I've got a constant floating around at the end here in case I, I misplaced my origin. Um, it turns out D in here is a very small number of pixels, uh, vanishingly small, so we don't need to worry about that. And B uh, in here is a, a horizontal offset of my origin, and B is also a very small uh, value in here, so actually I got my origin pretty, pretty good. Um, another comparison in here is the C squared is the same as the L squared in here, so C the same as L comes out to be 800 pixels, which is fine, but really I need that in, um, convert that to uh, millimeters. And the other bit in here, sorry, that should should read A at the bottom here. Um, A in here is this constant in here, which if you see is the thing that multiplies the X cubed. So it's, it's this bit here, it's P over EI times 12. Okay, so that's the bit that will get us at, at Young's modulus. Um, if we uh, measure things up, then actually we find that the, the span in here between the two uh, inner edges of my supports, that 800 pixels, is equivalent to um, well, is equivalent to uh, half of 56 millimetres. So it's 56 millimetres all the way across. Uh, but remember, um, C uh, is the same as half that span. It's the same as L. OK, so this then allows us to convert everything from pixels to millimetres. Um, and if I do that, uh, the value of A comes uh, through uh, to this thing in here. Um, the minus sign in here is, is just from the fact that the, um, the plus or minus direction on the, the uh, deflections was, was wrong in the images, so don't need to worry about the minus sign. And the other thing we need to do is, is just work out what this thing in here is, the uh, second moment of area. And for a circular cross-section, um, you can work that out or look it up in textbooks it comes out to be pi uh, times the radius to the power 4 divided by 4. So I need to measure the radius and um, here you can see me just uh, zeroing a, a micrometer uh, and then measuring off the uh, the diameter so twice r um, of the pasta which was a little bit under two millimeters in here so we've got r we can work out then what i is and um, we've measured that thing there from the fitting. We knew what the uh, load was. It was a 179 grams or 0.179 kilograms times 9.81 for our, our gravity. Um, and so we know everything in this apart from E, rearrange it to find E, plug the numbers in here, and I work out that the Young's modulus of spaghetti uh, from my kitchen scales and Lego construction uh, works out to be about three, a little bit over three gigapascals. And that's a halfway sensible number for a, um, for a, for a material like that. It's not particularly stiff. Um, remember, we could bend it quite, uh, quite easily. Um, nowhere near as stiff as uh, as many metallics so you just you can see just how little load I need to apply to, to make this this bend quite considerably. Um, for a, a metal we might be looking uh, more at um, maybe a, a hundred a little bit less than a hundred for some of the um, compliant metals up to um, uh, up to say uh, 200 gigapascals for a steel and, and maybe all the way up to 400 gigapascals for, for
for something like tungsten. Okay, um, so that was just a, a, a simple example of working through um, uh, from an experiment to extract a, um, a Young's modulus value using our beam bending theory. What I will do, as I said, I'll put the script uh, for this up on, on, on Canvas, uh, the MATLAB script, um, and I'll put some of the images up there um, so that you can, if you want to, work through some other examples with, with different loads. Um, that's it. That's the end of, uh, end of this course. Uh, I hope you've been able to uh, follow what's been going on. Um, if you haven't, well, we've had the Q&A sessions. Hope that's cleared some things up, but um, please work through the tutorial sheets and, and talk to your tutors about anything that's um, bugging you that you, you didn't quite get first time round.